Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are continuing our study. It's in the Gospel of Mark. We're in chapter 9. We're going to finish that chapter this morning, begin with verse 30 through verse 50. And I'm going to, uh, as I read, not read some of the verses here, at least I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible and verse 44, verse 46 are not found in the earliest text, so I'm not going to read them, though what they state, their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, is stated in the uh, verse 48, so it's, it's original, it's part, it's genuine, but I don't think that these were originally repeated, so we won't repeat those. But the Lord has been in the far north. He's been in Caesarea Philippi. Now he's moving south. And it's a deliberate move south toward Jerusalem. The trajectory of his ministry, as it were, is now in that direction. So we begin reading in verse 30. From there they went out and began to go through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know about it. For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, and telling them, the Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. But they did not understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask him. They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he began to question them. What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had discussed with one another which of them was the greatest. Sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Taking a child, he set him before them and asked him, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me, and whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not hinder him. For there is no one who will perform a miracle in my name and be able to soon afterward to speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is for us. For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because of your name as followers of Christ, truly I say to you, he will not lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe to stumble, it would be better for him if with a heavy millstone hung around his neck, he had been cast into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into hell into unquenchable fire. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than having your two feet to be cast into hell. If your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell. Where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if the salt becomes unsalty, with what will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. One day the philosopher Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel looked out the window of his study to see Napoleon in the street below leading his army to battle. He wrote to a friend and called it a remarkable sensation to see an individual on horseback raising his arm over the world and ruling it. He called the general this extraordinary man 
whom it is impossible not to admire. I suppose that's true. We are naturally enamored of power and a man on a horse leading armies. But Jesus wasn't. He gave his disciples a lesson on who is truly extraordinary when he told them, if anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. That lesson came as a result of a discussion he overheard the disciples having in which they were arguing among themselves about which of them was the greatest. Now these were a collection of fishermen, a tax collector, simple men, talking about their personal greatness, which is laughable, but typical. People think highly of themselves and they want attention. Maybe everyone to some degree, suffers from a Napoleonic uh, complex, even tall people. But what is, is really surprising about this discussion is when it occurred. It happened after Jesus told them about his death and sacrifice, which is the highest example of greatness in sacrifice and service. And that's where our passage begins. They had been in the far north, they'd been in Caesarea Philippi, and were now on their way south, passing through Galilee. Mark says that Jesus did not want anyone to know about this. His great Galilean ministry was over, and he was on his way to Jerusalem, where he would complete his mission of salvation. He didn't want to draw attention to himself so he could devote his time to his disciples and prepare them for the events that would occur six months later. So, verse 33 states that uh, he was teaching them, the Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. Now, this is the second time that he has announced his death to the disciples and one of the few examples of teaching in the book of Mark. Mark is primarily an account of the Lord's works, not his words. And that itself is instructive because the Lord did not come into the world primarily to say something, but to do something to give life through his death and resurrection to those who are dead in their sins. That is what we need to know about Christ. And that is what the disciples needed to understand. It is the gospel that they would preach. So Jesus again teaches them this essential truth about his ministry. They didn't understand it the first time that he told them that uh, he would be killed. And here, the second time, they still didn't understand because they had a mistaken idea of the Messiah. They were expecting the kingdom to come soon, the kingdom to come in all of its glory. And the cross just didn't fit into that. It didn't fit their idea of the Lord's reign on earth. So they didn't understand And they didn't ask for clarification. Mark adds, they were afraid to ask him. Well, why were they afraid? He doesn't tell us, and we can only speculate, but maybe one reason is because they had a sense of what he was saying. They've already heard this once. This is now the second time. Maybe something's beginning to sink in, and they're a little troubled about that. And so, like a person who's afraid to go to the doctor because of the news he might get, they didn't ask questions which didn't solve anything and only deprive them of understanding the good news that all of this was about. The, the best news of salvation from sin, of forgiveness from God, and resurrection from death. But they left the subject, walked on, and they discussed something else. 
Jesus evidently walked on ahead of them, but overheard the argument that they were having among themselves. He didn't say anything. He didn't interrupt the argument. He waited until they arrived in Capernaum and entered a house, probably Peter's house. And there the Lord asked them, what were you discussing on the way? Well, they were obviously embarrassed by the Lord's question because in verse 34, Mark wrote, they kept silent. They weren't discussing his death. They weren't discussing his sacrifice. They were discussing their own self-importance. They had a lot to learn. So the Lord took that opportunity to teach them on true greatness. It's not what they thought it was. If anyone wants to be first, and I'm sure at this point they're sitting there and they all begin to lean forward because that's what they want, to be first. He said, he shall be last of all and servant of all. And I suppose that hit them all between the eyes and they were thinking, what? That is a complete reversal of the world's standard of greatness, and and if we're honest with ourselves, a reversal of our own standard of greatness. I'm not in business. I I should be careful what I say about business, but what I have to say is what I think I can say about life in general. A friend of mine, now retired, told me many, many years ago that when he was young and in business, Uh, a colleague told him that here's the rule. This is how you live. Eat or be eaten. That's a driving force. Ambition, personal, selfish ambition, not just in business, but in life as a whole. That's how we get ahead. That's how we make something of ourselves. That's how we get what we want. It's, It's the way of the world, which is not to say, having said that, that the way of the church is the opposite in the sense that it's a way of apathy, a way of laziness, the way of indifference. No, not at all. Idleness has been called the nursery of sin, and I think that's true. Idleness is to have nothing to do with the Christian. We are laborers. We of all people should be active with drive and discipline. We are to be redeeming the time. Every moment is important. The question is, what are we laboring for? For self or for the Lord? Are we laboring laboring for time or for eternity? Cambridge scholar and commentator Henry Barclay Sweet called service the passport to eminence in the kingdom of God. And I think that is true. The greatest greatness is there in the kingdom, and the greatest greatness that's there is eternal. It never ends. It's not temporal. It's not transient. It's eternal. And we're to be laboring in that way. And Jesus was not asking His disciples to do anything that that He was not doing. He never does that. He never asks us to go where He wouldn't go. He never asks us to do what He would not do. As He will say in the next chapter, in chapter 10, He did not come to be served, but to serve. Paul wrote of this in Philippians chapter 2. That although Christ existed in the form of God, He took the form of a servant. He humbled Himself to the point of dying in obedience to the Father and dying a shameful, painful death, the death on the cross itself. Now this is the pattern of the Christian life. It's the pattern of selfless service. The Lord will come back to this again in the next chapter, as I just indicated in chapter 10. It comes back to it almost immediately after He's dealt with it here, which is, again, to show the importance of it. It has to be repeated. And it needed to be repeated because of the dull minds of these conceited disciples. Now, I call them conceited disciples, not because I'm looking down on them, but because it's true and because it's true of all of us. They were self-oriented. But here, to make clear his meaning, he illustrated it with a small child nearby. Took him in his arms. 
it was young, maybe an infant, and said to them in verse 37, whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me, and whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. The Lord loved children. Children were often near him and felt comfortable in his arms. I can't, I can't claim that virtue. I've got a brand new granddaughter, my fourth grandchild. I think by now I've got some facility with grandkids. I took her in my arms the other day, held her up, made a little face at her, and she began to smile, and that smile quickly turned into a look of terror, and she screamed, and I'm not bragging, but that little girl can, has the loudest, most heartfelt screams for her mother. It's like a monster had hold of her, but not so with the Lord. Whenever we see Him, He has children with Him. He has them in His lap or in His arms. They were comfortable there. And that tells us something about the Lord. But really the point here is not that, that Jesus was thinking so much of little children literally, but what they illustrate, which is the weak and the unimportant. That's their status in the world. Not among Him, but in the world. And that's what they represent. So in telling these disciples to receive that child, He was telling them to forget about themselves, forget about their personal ambition, and care for Christ's children, care for His lambs, to help the weak of the flock. And by doing that, they receive Christ Himself. Because He's in them. We're all joined together in Him. To receive them is to receive Him and to serve Him. Now that is where real greatness lies. In denying self and serving others. Serving the small and the unimportant. Those that will not advantage us in serving them. That's what Christ did. At this point, John speaks up, and he tells Jesus of a man the disciples had rebuked. And it's not altogether clear how this rebuke fits in with what the Lord has just said and why exactly he brought it up. Maybe he was seeking praise after the Lord's disapproval of their attitude of self-importance. And so maybe he's thinking, well, this, this will seem good to the Lord. This will appeal to him. Or maybe he was wondering if they'd acted improperly and just wanted clarification. But whatever the reason, he told of a man that he and the others had seen casting out demons in Christ's name. The man wasn't one of the twelve. He was not following us, John said. He had not been authorized by Jesus to do what he was doing. So he said, we tried to prevent him. The man succeeded in casting out demons. He did what they failed to do earlier in this chapter because his use of Jesus' name was not as some magical formula. He did it in faith. It was reality for him. They tried to pre prevent him, John says, and I think the suggestion is they tried and failed. He continued to exercise demons and did so because he believed what he was doing was right. He was a man of faith. He was a man of conviction. So the problem wasn't one of orthodoxy. It was a problem of association. The, the stranger was straight in his beliefs, he was casting out demons through the name of Jesus, but he was not part of their circle. He was not one of us. He was a believer in Christ, but he was an outsider to them. It was really a problem of rivalry. So John wondered, did we do the right thing? And the Lord's reply indicated that no, they had not done the right thing. They were too exclusive and they went beyond their authority. Verse 39, Do not hinder him, Jesus said, for there is no one who will perform a miracle in my name and be able soon afterwards to speak evil of me. 
When a person does a work in Christ's name and according to His will, he can't speak against the Lord since he has attributed his work to the power of the Lord. Now, I offer a caveat here. That doesn't apply to just anyone who uses the name of the Lord. We have plenty of televangelists who speak about Jesus and use the name of the Lord simply to get money. All the false teachers use the name of the Lord. They're false. They have a different idea of Christ. They have a different theology. So this is not speaking of anybody that simply uses the name of Christ as some kind of formula. This is speaking of people who are orthodox, people who, who understand the truth, genuine believers. He who is not against us, Jesus said, is for us. There's, there's no neutrality with Christ. And the one who is proclaiming Christ, proclaim, proclaiming Him truly, correctly, is a friend and not an enemy. So the implication here is not just leave him alone, but help him. It's not just don't criticize him because he is not in your group or he's not in your denomination, but encourage him. Moses dealt with, dealt with something similar to that when two men, Eldad and Medad, were prophesying in the camp and Joshua saw it and Joshua became concerned. He was afraid that their popularity would threaten Moses' position of preeminence among the people. And so he told Moses to make them stop. And Moses refused. He said to Joshua, are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets and the Lord would put his spirit on them. In other words, it's not about me. It's about the Lord and His work. Moses was for whatever furthered the gospel and the glory of God. This same spirit of rivalry exists in churches today. But where there is unity in the fundamentals of the faith, unity in Christ, we are to receive one another as brothers and sisters and help. We're to encourage there are others, other examples of that in, in the book of Acts. We have an example of that with Priscilla and Aquila when they heard Apollos preach. He was an amazing man. He's described as mighty in the Scriptures. And he could proclaim it eloquently and well. And he was known for that, became known for that. But at this point, his theology was not complete he was only acquainted with the baptism of John. But Priscilla and Aquila didn't criticize him for what he didn't know. They didn't ostracize him because he was not one of the apostles or he wasn't from their hometown or their place. He was from Alexandria. He was from outside of their circle. They didn't cut him off for any of that. They did just the opposite. It's not that they just didn't criticize him. They took action to be a blessing to him. They took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And Apollos received it. That's important as well. I know two weeks ago, Mike in the study in Proverbs taught Proverbs chapter 10 verses, I think it was 6 through 9. But in that small section of Proverbs, there's verse 8, which says, The wise of heart will receive commands. Those who are wise will be humble enough to receive instruction and correction. And that was true of Apollos. And because he did that, and because these two individuals took the time to give him counsel, Apollos became a mighty servant of the Lord in Ephesus and Corinth and throughout the church. That's what we're to do. Not be an obstacle to the ministry of others, but an encouragement. And we do that in a variety of ways. They did it through speaking to him personally. I'm sure they were tactful and they knew how to do it and they pointed out the inconsistencies and helped him and he received it. Sometimes we don't have that opportunity, but we can always pray. And that is such a vital part of the ministry. We studied that at some length last week. It is so essential that we do that, that we be in prayer for one another, bearing one another's burdens and bearing them to the throne of grace. 
But that's part of being a servant. Greatness of the kind Jesus speaks of here rises above party spirit. It is humble. It is tolerant of others when they are weak and gives help in whatever way that it can be given. That's what we're to do. Jesus gives an example of it in verse 41. For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because of your name as followers of Christ, truly I say to you, he will not lose his reward. Even the simplest act of kindness, like offering a cup of water to a person because he or she belongs to Christ, is significant. And it shows, that statement shows how wide Christian ministry really is. What we think of Christian ministry as doing something like this, standing in a pulpit and preaching or going out and doing evangelism, preaching the gospel to the lost or going out on the foreign mission field. And all of that is Christian ministry. It's service. But really, all of the Christian life is an opportunity of service. And as we walk by faith and obedience daily, as we are where we're supposed to be, doing what we're supposed to be doing, God gives in His providence opportunities to minister. And those opportunities come in some of the smallest things, like giving a cup of water to someone. The point is, nothing is trivial. Nothing's trivial to the Lord. God is aware of the smallest acts of kindness that we offer. And he considers what we do for one another to be done to his son. That's how important our deeds are to him. In fact, in Matthew's account of this, in Matthew 10, verse 42, the Lord says, give a cup of cold water. So Matthew adds a detail that Mark didn't give. And that's significant, I think, because what it says there, what I gather from that is, it, this, this water that we give to someone should be freshly drawn from the well. It should, it should be the best cup of water that we can offer to someone. Small things are important. And they should be the best that we can give of the small things. Moses told Joshua, would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put His Spirit upon them, and here the Lord says, in effect, would that all the Lord's people would offer a cup of water to the least of the saints. That's where greatness is. Not in ambitious efforts at self-exaltation. Jeremiah had a scribe, a man who wrote down the prophet's words. His name was Baruch. He was an important man. But toward the end of the book, the prophet had a prophecy for Baruch. God told Jeremiah to say to him, Are you seeking great things for yourself? Do not seek them. That's the message Jesus had for his disciples. Don't seek greatness. Serve. And in serving, you will become truly great. Serve the small, serve the weak and serve them in the smallest ways. That's a great person. The Lord loves His children, and He wants us to love one another. He wants us to take care of His children with the same concern that He has. So, maybe with the child still in His arms, He gave a warning against leading His children astray, Verse 42, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe to stumble, it would be better for him if with a heavy millstone hung around his neck, he had been cast into the sea. Now what he's saying is, that's better. The way the Lord will deal with such a person is far worse than that. What he doesn't say, not explicitly there. But this is what the world does. It causes God's people to stumble spiritually and morally. And God will deal with the guilty and deal with them severely. 
But we need to be aware of that. We need to be prepared for that. We need to be ready for such people and the world. And to, we need to prepare those who are young in the faith to be ready for that. So that they're not surprised by the things around them. They're not surprised by the ways of the world and its seduction. And that is a good word to use for the world. Seduction. And the greatest seduction is of the mind. It is error packaged as truth. Paul speaks of Satan disguising himself as an angel of light in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. And so his attack begins against the light. He disguises himself as one of truth, of having the truth in order to attack the truth. And what that means is generally, I think, essentially, he begins his, his attack on us with an attack on the Bible because it is our authority for faith and practice, our authority for life. That's where he began. We're introduced to the serpent in Genesis 3. And what does he do? Where does his attack begin? On the Word of God. Hath God said? Really? Did he say that? And so it goes. He attacks the Word of God, the Scriptures. It is God's revelation given through the divinely inspired prophets and apostles, and through it, through the Scriptures, the Holy Spirit gives faith through that. He gives us strength and life. It is vital for our spiritual life. So the spiritual enemy tries to undermine its influence by denying its validity, by denying its inspiration and inerrancy or its sufficiency. That even happens in evangelical churches in, in very subtle ways. This is for, for many years, this is the, the, the battle against the Scriptures has been understood to be not just against its inerrancy and its authority, but its sufficiency. And I think that's correct. Well, we need the Bible, that's true. We, we give lip service to that, but really what we need is this or that addition, this program or that program, not against programs, believe me. But... The problem can be when they become predominant and the Word of God is not attended to as it ought to be and we don't rely upon it. And so we then begin to neglect the preaching of Scripture, the study of Scripture. We begin to ignore the ordinances of the church taking the Lord's Supper. They, begin, they are replaced by other things. When that happens, that is a victory for the devil. But that's life in this world. Those are the kinds of things we face. We live in a sinful, selfish world that hates the light. Unbelieving people oppose the truth and are hostile towards God's people. And the devil is always trying to trap us in a temptation of one kind or another. That's the nature of things. And I think that explains things. It doesn't excuse things. Those in the world who are guilty of such things, of misleading God's children, are responsible and they are warned here in this passage of judgment that will come upon them. And it's serious judgment. It's not enough though for us to, to watch for the dangers in the world. We, we must not only be ready for them, we must be ready to take decisive action on ourselves personally to avoid them, to protect ourselves. And so our Lord says in verse 43, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into hell into the unquenchable fire. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than having your two feet to be cast into hell. If your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell. Well, those are hard words and extreme recommendations not to be taken literally. And if you just think about it, it's obvious it's not to be taken literally. If one cuts off his hand, that doesn't keep one from wanting to steal and take something for oneself. 
Plucking out one's eye doesn't keep one from coveting. That's a problem of the heart. But this is a, a way of underscoring the fact that sin is so virulent that it can't be tolerated at all. It is deadly and it must be cut off at the source. And to make that point clearly, the Lord speaks of doing radical surgery to separate us from things that may be precious to us at the, at a, at the time, but cause us to stumble. Separate yourself from every temptation. Now, no one wants to lose a hand or a foot, but if it's infected... If, it, if gangrene is spreading and threatens a person's life, then the limb needs to be removed. I think that's the picture he's giving here. The Lord doesn't say what the, affection, the infection or temptation is. Lust, covetousness are always concerns, but certainly pride is one. And, and it especially fits the context, wanting to be great. Ex, 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 Exerting oneself over others. That's a strong influence in our lives. Exalting self. In spite of this lesson, these are strong words that the Lord has given here. Very pointed. But in spite of this lesson, in the next chapter, the disciples are still arguing about greatness. And who is going to sit on Christ's right and left hand in the kingdom? This is a hard lesson to learn because it is about denying self, which is against the natural way that we think. But it not only causes us to stumble personally, it affects others around us. It's destructive. I mentioned Napoleon. He, through his conquest, he raised France to be the leading nation of Europe. But by the time he was finished... He had brought about the death of much of a generation and wrecked the country. That because of his pride. So when it's in us, it doesn't just affect us, it affects others. It is destructive. So we must cut off whatever encourages sin. We can only do that ultimately by the power of the Holy Spirit in His work of sanctification. We cannot do it in our own strength. We do it through Him but the believer will do that. Not perfectly, but the believer will do that. The unbeliever doesn't. And his unbelief and sin have terrible consequences. Eternal judgment. Described here in lurid language to give emphasis to the terror of it. Hell is his end. Now literally, the word this translated hell is the word Gehenna, which refers to the Valley of Hinnom on the southern side of Jerusalem. It came to represent hell because of its infamous history. In the days of King Ahaz and King Manasseh, it was the site of pagan worship and child sacrifice. They set up altars to false gods, and we read that the kings made their sons pass through the fire. You wonder how many Children, how many little babies were put through that horrific end out of false worship, false devotion to false gods? Well, in the time of Christ, it had a different function. By this time, they've gone into the Babylonian captivity and they were cured there of idolatry. That's not a problem after the Babylonian captivity. And so they came back to Jerusalem, and that valley, which had such a hideous history, became appropriately the garbage dump for Jerusalem. It's where the trash and refuse were burned, and where there was fire and smoke continually, day and night. So it came to symbolize the place of divine judgment, a place of unquenchable fire, the Lord says. It is eternal he emphasizes that in verse 48 where he quotes Isaiah 66 verse 24. It's the last verse of the book of Isaiah where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. In other words, it is a place of endless punishment as indicated by the fact that the instruments of punishment never end. 
Because those there being punished never end. It's endless punishment. It is a terrible warning and a terrible thought. The author of Hebrews brings that out when he says, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And I would submit that we have no idea how terrifying it really is. He is a God of grace. But He's also a just and holy God who must punish sin. And the sin and the punishment for the sin that He will give will be perfect and righteous and just. It will be terrifying. And so Christ taught judgment and taught it for people's good. Not simply to terrify them or manipulate them, but to alert them to the peril of their souls and move them to faith and repentance. All who do that escape that terrible fire, but they don't enter into a comfortable, carefree life. There is their own kind of fire that our Lord mentions. I referred to Mike Black's lesson two weeks ago, and in that, right at the beginning, he gave a little story of two Scotsmen who are walking down a road, and they see another one coming in the other direction, someone they knew, and they said, where, why are you going so quickly? Where are you going? And he said, I'm going to see my pastor burn. And so it is in the history of the church. There have been many who have gone through the fire literally. And so the Lord speaks here of that in the last two verses. Verse 49, for everyone will be salted with fire. It's an unusual expression, salted with fire. And I think it, it's puzzling when you look at it and just think about it. What does that mean? But both fire and salt have po a positive function. Fire purifies metals. Gold and silver purifies them of their impurities. And salt is a preservative. And the Lord may have borrowed this image from Leviticus chapter 2 and verse 17 where sacrifices and offerings are described as seasoned with salt signifying the purity of the offering. And that's what we're to be. We're to be a, a holy sacrifice to the Lord. Our lives are to be a pure offering to God. But because some profess faith and are not genuine and will go to the fire of judgment, the Lord says everyone, all of those who name the name of Christ, will be salted with fire. The church will suffer fiery trials to pur purify it, to purge it, to separate the true from the false. But also, it purifies genuine believers. Difficulties, hardships, trials, persecution by destroying what's bad in us and bringing out what is good. So all will be salted with fire. It is only a, a pure church that can have a good witness. The Lord speaks of that in verse 50. He says, have salt in yourselves. Don't let it become unsalty. And again, salt is a preservative. And in the Christian life, it is faithfulness through the trials, faithfulness to the Word of God, faithfulness that produces purity. So what does a salted life look like? It looks like the life of Christ, a life of service, a life of selfish ambition, of seeking the first place, seeking the world's greatness. That is a life that has become unsalted. When the salt is lost, we lose our influence in the world and and even among ourselves, when the salt is lost, we lose our influence with each other in the church. Real greatness, Jesus said, is not in being served, but in serving. That is what lasts and lasts forever. The things you do, the smallest things you do, offering a cup of water to another believer has reward that's forever, infinite. That's what comes with imitating Christ, and that's the life we're to live. 
The great of this world ultimately come to nothing. We admire them. We all do. But what they have comes to nothing. They have it for only a brief moment and then it's gone and gone forever. Napoleon, who Hegel could not help but admire, lost it all. Charles Bridges wrote that when Napoleon was on his deathbed on the island of St. Helena, he said, what an abyss between my deep wretchedness and Christ's eternal kingdom, proclaimed, loved, adored, and spreading through the world. How many lives of great men have ended in disillusion and bitterness? Martin Luther was right. The empire of the world is but a crust to be thrown to a dog. And so Jesus asked, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? What? What's the profit? Well, the point of that rhetorical question is obvious. Nothing. Life that is eternal, greatness that is real and forever is in Christ and in Christ alone who died for sinners, who died for all who believe in Him. If you haven't believed in Him, come to Him. Trust in Him. He saves all who do. And then He sets you on a road to genuine, real greatness. Eternal greatness. God help you to come to Him and help all of us to set our minds to being great in this way by serving one another. Father, we do thank You for that gift. I was born among those mockers and your son saved me. Thank you. I speak for everyone here. Thank you for his ransom that bought us out of the domain of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light. We thank you for him. May we live for him. May we serve one another. In Christ's name, amen.